This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Well, I'd like to welcome our special guest today, Kurt Niemeyer. Kurt, how are you doing today? I'm fabulous. Greg, how about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, joining us for this podcast. I'd like to find out, first off, what kind of cars do you collect? I collect European sports cars. All right, so I know Alphas are one of them, is that right? Alfa Romeo, Austin Healey, Jaguar, MG, Porsche, Ferrari, Sunbeam. A little bit of everything. Yeah, Morgan. Wow, okay. I like them all. Well, now, why do you like all of the British cars? What draws you to the British car mark? I know it's not the electronics, right? Well, you know, second-guessing Joseph Lucas is almost a full-time job. (laughs) They're they're just so such classic sports cars, and uh, I appreciate the history and what they established in this country after the GIs came back, and I do have an MGTC that I dearly love, and... uh, Every time I drive it, I just uh, rock it back to the 1940s and imagine what it was like to see those cars for the first time when you were accustomed to Chevrolets and Oldsmobiles and Fords and uh, that sort of uh, large, bulbous automobile, and then you see this tiny little uh, sport about. (laughs) Yeah, and you just gave me a lot of stuff to think about here. So could you dispel the Lucas myth? Yes. Uh, Lucas Electrics are very uh, capable as long as they're well-maintained and you maintain proper ground. Cleaning the ground is uh, important, whether it's Lucas, Morelli, or Bosch. And uh, those three fellows were actually related. They were cousins. Now, I, I just bring that up because they're all the same. You know? oh. <laughs> it, it was just the, the state of the technology at that point. And, I actually have two Alfa Romeos that have uh, Lucas Electrics and Girling brakes on them. They're their own international rolling incidents there. <laughs> All the electrics from the 40s through the um, 80s will, will give you issues at, at times. So uh, Lucas just gets a bad rap. I think it was because there were so many British cars that came to this country. So there were more, there was a higher incidence of issues due to the fact that there were more British cars on the road. Yeah, and speaking of which, can you talk a little bit about that? I know that after World War II, I guess the GIs, you know, they they discovered these British cars uh, during World War II, and that kind of led them to have the desire to have them in the U.S., so they started importing some. Could you kind of speak to that a little bit? Sure, yeah. When the the GIs went to uh, Great Britain, they had all these tiny little cars. They had uh, Austin 7, there were three-wheeled Morgans, and Morgan had just come up with the four-wheeler a couple of years before that. MG was building uh, small cars. uh, And then there were a number of marks that are no longer with us that uh, died out during the war. But the uh, GIs, those those cars were exciting. And, you know, after you spend a couple of years with somebody shooting at you or trying to (laughs) shoot you out of the sky or, uh, you know, whatever, you need some excitement to uh, maintain your... uh, your level of uh, adrenaline. So they started bringing these cars back to this country, and that's how my family got involved. My dad's older brother, Bob Niemeyer, uh, saw some of the British cars when he was in the Army Air Corps. He was a mechanic in the Army Air Corps and heard about the British cars. And so in 1948, he and my dad bought a two and a half liter Riley. It's been a uh, wild ride ever since, with hundreds of sports cars going through the family and a uh, lot, many, many hours of enjoyment. So, with so many British cars that kind of run through your family, what is one of your favorites, and do you still have it? I like them all, but uh, one of my uh, favorites, and it's, it was a favorite with my uh, folks too, are the uh, XK Jaguars, the one forties, one forties, and I have a one twenty. It's, it's a fabulous car. It's one of the few cars in the collection that has a lot of torque, and uh, as most of the uh, cars that we have are uh, small displacement four cylinders, exclusive of much torque. So I love to get out in the Jaguar with the uh, big six cylinder and uh, just experience that acceleration and the torque that the XK120 offers. Right, right. And now you also mentioned, I think you said a Ferrari. So all of these British cars and then a Ferrari. How does that warrant a spot in your collection? Well, it was a milestone car. It's a 246 Dino GT. A mid-engine, you know, very stylish. It really uh, 
launched the mid-engine craze, and my dad was always interested in what was the next big thing in auto design. He worked in the manufacturing business, and so he, he liked to keep pace with that. And when uh, the 246s were so popular and so stylish, he had the opportunity to buy one, and he jumped at it, and uh, we've had it ever since. Wow, what color is it? It was repainted by the first owner and they tried to make it Barchetta Rosa and they missed it by a, a country mile. So <laughs> it's kind of an undescribable color. So it's Barchetta Rose-ish maybe. <laughs> Ish. Yes, yes. It's a very deep dark red. Now is it a chairs and flares version? Yes it is. Oh nice, okay. Yes it is. Wonderful car to drive. I had grown accustomed to driving the traditional V12 Ferraris, the 330s and 250s. We'd had a couple of those go through the collection, and I uh, had done quite a few uh, updates on those and uh, worked on Friends 330s, and uh, they they, they drove like trucks. They were really heavy in the front end, and you get into the 246, and you can drive it with your fingertips. It's a very light, light, lightsome, quick nimble little car yeah and, beautiful uh, car yeah so you know they're uh they're great drivers and very comfortable and easy to drive true grand touring car where you can set out on a journey and uh, get there and not feel like you've uh, been beat up on the way yeah now my million dollar question is is does it have a ferrari emblem on the trunk lid no it does not good for you <laughs> keeping it original right 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 well I call my enterprise here Sports Car Preservation, and uh, we uh, celebrate the history of these cars. We try to keep them as original as possible, and uh, that way we know how the manufacturer built them. And so many cars today are over-restored and restored incorrectly, uh, modified for convenience and, and better performance. So uh, we try to keep everything in order. That's awesome. Well, speaking of which, can you talk a little bit about your enterprise and also the Cincy Motorsport Journal and all the fun stuff you're doing in the Cincinnati area? We have, uh, in the collection, we have eight vehicles that are all original. Oh, wow. Three of them actually have the original tires on them. So oh, my goodness. Very, we're, we, we drive them very gingerly and uh, mostly just around the neighborhood. My dad and I uh, and my brother uh, is involved in this uh, also. Uh, my folks have uh, passed on to their next journey, but uh, my brother and I maintain this. We find that it's a lot easier to preserve cars than it is to restore them, less uh, time-consuming and less cash-intensive. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, gives you more time to go out and enjoy the car and, and drive it. I have an, an enterprise called Sports Car Preservation, preserving the cars, the culture, and the characters. And uh, there are so many strong characters in the sports car world. And I grew up in FCCA club racing. My dad raced. My mom was the driving force behind the racing team. My brother and I were the crew. We uh, had great success with that. My brother's gone on to become a uh, national champion and won the uh, FCCA runoffs. I've got a number of regional and divisional championships. That's where it all started. And uh, when uh, my brother and I went off to college, my dad said, oh, I'm losing my uh, my slave labor, my crew. So he went <laughs> right? back to collecting street cars. And, uh, <laughs> but my folks were always there to support us in our racing effort. Anyway, and it, and it was a family uh, thing. We had aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody showed up. That was the family activity with sports car racing. Now I uh, publish the monthly electronic motoring gazette. Uh, here in southwestern Ohio, and it uh, covers uh, cars, bikes, boats, and airplane activities. Mostly it lets people know what's coming up, where they can take their vehicle and enjoy it. And I maintain the uh, Cincy Motorsports Journal Facebook page. I've also, uh, to help preserve the uh, culture and characters of uh, the uh, sport, I uh, revived the Bell Fountain Hill Climb. It was uh, successful beyond my wildest dreams, I'll put it that way. And uh, now I'm, I'm planning Revival 2, August 28th through 30th in Bell Fountain, Ohio. It was a hill climb. It was an SCCA event from 1953 to 74. Our um, fast car up the hill this year was a Yanko Stinger, driven by Jim Shart, who competed in the original hill climb in the uh, late 60s and early 70s was his time there. He's got a genuine Yanko Stinger. He uh, 
won the Corvair Revival at Mid-Ohio in June, came and uh, showed everybody the fast way up the hill at uh, Bell Fountain. Yeah, could you speak a little bit about the Grand Marshal this year? I'll have Dick on in the future episode of this podcast. Dear friend, Dick Weiss, he was a good friend of my dad. Dick is still driving the 1958 Porsche Speedster Carrera that he won the F production class at Bell Fountain with in 1962, a week after he got his competition license. So uh, he was our grand marshal, wore his uh, vintage helmet. What a a character. The guy uh, just can't be beat. He's an octogenarian now, and he's uh, not backing off any. I can tell you that. He uh, pushed that Porsche for all it was worth up the hill and in the autocross at Bell Fountain. It's just a joy to see somebody that enjoys their car so much and drives it in the manner that it was intended to be driven. And for proof of this, you can go to my Instagram page at The Collector Car Podcast, where I got to the hill climb just as he was taking off. And so I got a video. I posted on Instagram. I got there just in the nick of time, so it worked out great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a uh, fabulous Grand Marshal and a fitting uh, recipient of that honor because uh, he had been there before. And he and I had actually gone up to Bell Fountain several times in our Porsches and driven the hill on a uh, Saturday morning or a Tuesday morning just to uh, get a taste of what it was. And uh, he was so he's so enthusiastic about everything he does, everything Porsche, and he's really uh, quite the uh, resource on the 356s. Since we got our 356s, he's the only person other than my brother and I that uh, work on them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Use them as a parts resource, a technical resource. Fabulously knowledgeable gentleman. I remember as a kid, he would flat toe that uh, speedster to the SCCA races with a VW square back. <laughs> and uh, he, would, uh, he would show up. And uh, the first time I remember him, he was actually driving the car to the track. And uh, my dad had gone from flat towing to using an open trailer. And Dick put the windshield and bumper under the uh, trailer so nobody would drive over them uh, going through the paddock. <laughs> you know, he's got a lot of history. And, uh, geez, so, you know, let's uh, let's celebrate all these uh, fellows while we still can. Right, for sure. Well, you just reviewed all your cool cars in your collection for the most part. A lot of preservation cars. So is there one on your list? Do you have a next car, or are you happy with what you have? I'm very happy with what I've got, but, you know, when you get this this condition, (laughs) and there's no known cure for it, and there's no reason to cure it, is uh, I'm I'm always looking uh, for uh, something else. I'm a rabid alpha collector, but anybody that uh, has alphas understands that desire. So I'm always looking for more alphas. I'd like to get an alfetta. Uh, mechanically injected alfetto. There's a one time I uh, had several dozen of those in a barn. <laughs> They're very unloved cars, so I'd like to get an alfetto coupe. That's always a possibility. I'd like to have a Crosley Hot Shot, mm-hmm. and uh, those uh, are fascinating little cars. But uh, I definitely adhere to the adage that it's more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow. So uh, I'm always looking for uh, tiny cars. I'd like to have a uh, Triumph Spitfire, another neat car that observed a lot in my youth. I've got a TR6 that's uh, coming to the collection uh, when the uh, original owner is finished with it, and hopefully that'll be a number of years yet because he does enjoy the car. It's an all-original example also. Oh, wow, that's cool. So another, other than that, it's whatever crosses my path at the right time because the right car usually finds you yeah and if you want to drive a slow car fast a crosley is a great one to do that in (laughs) oh oh, yeah and and they have such great local Cincinnati history well are there any trends you've seen recently in the collector car marketplace that you can identify for our listeners you know the marketplace is always an interesting (laughs) subject because so many people uh they try to put a dollar value on all these cars and really to me the value of the car is do you enjoy it you enjoy driving it? Do you enjoy working on it? And there are so many different things you can do with collector cars. Some people just like to tinker with them and polish them, and, uh, you know, they don't ever 
really take them anywhere or drive them much. Other people are relentless uh, drivers and they're constantly repairing and maintaining and, you know, they'll get in the car and drive. Uh, like the Austin Healy Club this summer had uh, about a dozen members from the Ohio Valley region that drove to Deadwood, South Dakota. It was three thousand, almost 3,000 miles round trip. Wow. 948 cc bug eyes. <laughs> wow, <laughs> well, well, and and in big heelys, and they uh, they had a had a great time. They they really uh, relentlessly drive the club uh, cars. You know, I think the dollar wise, uh, there's been a little market correction lately. Uh, some of the uh, prices have gone a little bit softer. Some of the cars have uh, slipped from their uh, what I heard described one day as brain damage money. Uh, levels of uh, <laughs> value uh you know people ask me you know what cars you know what my cars are worth and i go well you know that one's worth a lot to me because i enjoy driving it and i enjoy fixing it i enjoy you know tinkering with it and cleaning you know all the ground so the lights work and making it operate even though it's 70 years old people are always uh concerned that there aren't enough youth coming into the uh market if you expose the youth and you give them the opportunity to have a hands-on experience with the car, they'll enjoy the car. I have found with several events that if you present the older cars to the uh, young people of today, they will embrace them if they're given the opportunity. Yeah, that's a really great point. And let, let's face it, some of the uh, folks that are moving to the point in their lives now where they have disposable income to spend on a car, the cars of their youth were uh, K cars and Chevy Citation. And so <laughs> I've seen, you know, uh, Pintos and Vegas attaining new price levels. And that's understandable. Everything, you know, there's going to be a 40-year lag on all this stuff. So what was popular 40 years ago is going to start growing in, uh, in value right now. If you're driven to making money off of buying and selling cars, that's where I would look. It's funny you say that. A Chevrolet Citation, I think a 1981 Citation was the first car I ever drove because it was an automatic. And you never see those because they pretty much self-destructed back in the day. So if you do find one, especially one without rust that is complete, snap it up now because <laughs> there's just not many of them, right? Well, now it's time to play my little game. I think I gave you a okay. heads up on. I hope I did. Called Keep, Cash, or Crush. So I give you three cars. And you have to pick which one you want to keep forever, which one you want to cash in, and which one you don't mind sending to the crusher. Okay. I try to make this as hard as possible. <laughs> okay. Okay. So for you, I've picked three iconic British cars that okay. were in movies. Now, they're not okay. the $5 million James Bond DB5. Yeah. I'm not going to be that cruel. So the first one is Mr. Bean's Mini. I think it was Yellow from the TV show yep. Mr. Bean. Yep. The second one is James Bond's Lotus submarine that you can't actually drive on a street. Yep. Or the TVR Tuscan from the horrible movie with John Travolta, Swordfish. So, cool car, horrible movie. So, we've got Mr. Bean's Mini, James Bond's Lotus submarine, or the TVR Tuscan. Okay. I, I, would, uh, I would cash out on the Lotus. Everybody loves James Bond. There's always going to be a healthy market for that. I will uh, crush the mini because they've made so many of them. Another one will come down the road that you can that you can add to your collection. <laughs> and uh, right. then I would keep the TVR because it's such a unique and rare car and just exemplifies the small British manufacturer uh, like TVR, Turner, and Elva, and, and that sort of uh, manufacturer. So TVR, I would definitely put into the collection. So were you not a Mr. Bean fan, or that just the movie or the TV show just doesn't add value for you for the mini? There are so many uh, tribute Mr. Bean cars available that it's just it, that's a whole numbers game right there. There were, there were so <laughs> many of them. There's only one James Bond submarine Lotus, and you know there are. Uh, a handful of uh, TVR Tuscan. So it's a rarity thing. Right. It's a rarity thing. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, awesome. Thanks for joining us today. What's the best way our listeners can learn more about all the other work you're doing in the car world? Check into the uh, Bell Fountain Hill Climb Revival uh, page on Facebook or uh, Cincy Motorsports Journal uh, page on Facebook. Uh, those are the best ways to uh, to keep up and uh, or at uh, Kurt D. Meyer on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today, Kurt. Well, thank you, Greg. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast. <laughs>